And so um, I would like today to talk about the latest in work in this field of socially assistive robotics. But before we dive into it, I want to say my message that I've been saying at every talk for the last few years. Um, and some of you have maybe seen the slide, but I think the message bears repeating. And it is a message of balance that in our field of robotics, which we all of course love and have been in for a long time, um, there's an imbalance in terms of uh, what we're investing in, in terms of human resources and of course, funding and you know things that make things happen. Um, and that is that there's the great preponderance of work in automation and not so much in augmentation. Um, and that is causing some concerns for the general public. So of course, if you're in robotics, AI or machine learning, you hear about people's concerns about the future of work. Um, and I think it is interesting to think about this seriously. And it's important to think about how what we do affects the future. After all, we have the luxury and the responsibility to create the future. And so the vast majority of work is in automation, which is threatening to some. Um, not enough is in augmentation. The original versions and visions of robotics were more about helping people do their own work rather than doing their work for them. So that's just a message that I want to put out there, that robotics has amazing potential, um, which does not necessarily always require doing the work for someone, but should also involve doing the work with someone or helping them do their own work. And that is what I want to focus on because I want to tell you what's happened in this field of socially assistive robotics over the last 20 years, because it is that old now. Um, so yeah, it's hard to believe, time flies. Um, so I want to tell you about what's happened with the notion of having machines that help people to be able to do their own work without doing that physical work for them. In fact, by interacting with them without any physical touch or physical work. Um, and this really has to do with that sweet spot of helping people have the motivation um, and the social support. But in order to that, make that happen, we have to do what we would call a full stack now of perception, activity understanding, probably affective computing, um, intent prediction, um, user modeling, and so on. And so I'll be talking probably at the intersection of all of those fields and hopefully something for everyone. So if we look at what's happened over the last 20 years, um, in the early 2000s, and I'm going to use examples from my own lab, but of course they go well beyond the lab, but I can get these pictures without approval. So in the early 2000s, um, the field started with single studies. People would try things in the lab or they would go maybe, let's say, and spend an hour at a hospital and try to collect some data. And about 10 years later, people were starting to collect data over multiple sessions of humans and robots interacting mostly in the lab, but hopefully starting to get out of the lab as well. And now in the last three years or so, we're seeing much longer term studies. Of course, there are outliers. Some people were doing longer studies a few years earlier, but in general, because of the combination of enabling factors, including computing, machine learning, perception, you know, better batteries, you name it, every single thing, um, making things possible for, for us to get out of the lab and into the real world and collect data over a longer time scale. And that's really, as you will see, what's necessary in order to make this kind of robotics possible. It's interesting to think about what kind of robotics is really getting out into the real world. So some of us have been in the field for a long time uh, and we'd like more things to be happening outside of the lab. And it takes a long time. So it's nice to see this much progress in 20 years. But suppose that we project into the future and now the robots are everywhere. Okay, I don't know when that'll happen, but it'll happen. And then what? How are humans going to respond to that? Well, I've gotten a little more pessimistic. Maybe the pandemic influenced me, but um, let's talk about how people respond to robots, what we know, and then let's project what may happen and what, what can we do about it? So certainly studies over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, a great deal of studies have been done, and studies have shown that we as humans are wired to treat lifelike machines as if they were truly agents with motivation and possibly even biology, right? So we assume that such agents have goals, intentions, emotions, um, and therefore we feel relatedness to them. We feel empathy towards them. Uh, we choose to be helpful, and I'll show you some studies of that. But also, because they are like people, but not quite people, or they're like animals, but they're not quite animals, they also can come off as creepy. Um, and they can give us cognitive dissonance, and then they can result in abuse and bullying. And so interestingly, um, while there are a lot of studies that show that people 
can be their best selves around robots, and robots can help us be better people. Uh, there are also studies that show that people kick robots, they throw them down, they, um, and I don't mean for fun in videos, I mean, you know, there are YouTube videos that people don't want to have up uh, demonstrating really bad behavior. So why is this happening and why does it matter? It matters because the more robots there are, the more this will happen. Um, so people have cognitive biases. This is who we are. This is how we're wired. Um, and we project those on machines. And because they're not quite people and they're not quite biological, they can bring out in us the good or the bad. They could be in group, they could be out group. Um, and it's really tricky to think about how do we design machines so that they bring out the best and not the worst in us. So how do we do that? How do we des design machines that will make us better and that we will accept? It's a really hard question. And in fact, there's not going to be a single answer. So, sorry, this is going to be really hard. And if I was optimistic before, I'm slightly less optimistic now based on, for example, what happened with COVID. Here we are in Japan, everyone's wearing masks. Uh, I came from the US where people don't really want to wear masks. Before that, I was in Italy, nobody wore masks. So um, it's one specific measure that I guess has been certainly sufficiently shown to be a good idea. And yet the acceptance was varied tremendously, depending on politics, ideology, culture, regions, etc. It will be no different with the acceptance of robots in daily lives and the stakes will be higher. So the road ahead is not smooth, but that's okay, we like challenges. So, so let's talk about how we can design machines that at least hopefully will bring out the best in people. So I'll tell you about various studies that we have done over the last few years. This is most recent stuff. So for example, one of the studies we did is we took the IEEE data set of robots. It's very cool, there's an app, IEEE robots. Um, and that's a nice curated set of 165 robot embodiments of real robots um, that exist in labs, etc. Um, and we basically measured people's uh, sort of thoughts, feelings, expectations, and metaphors that they project onto these robots. So we took this data set, we crowdsourced it, we got a bunch of information, there's a journal paper about it. Um, and what we found was, again, these biases, right? Like, for example, um, if a robot was even slightly human-like, people immediately ascribed gender to it, even if the designers had no notion of ascribing gender. If the robot was um, not human-like, then there wasn't necessarily a description of gender and no robot had multiple genders, things like that. These topics are becoming more complex these days. Um, none of this was in the intent of the designer. So that's important because you design a robot and you don't anticipate how are people going to actually perceive it because sometimes you can't. Um, so we created this public um, tool that anyone can, you know, you can grab it off the slide and you can use your phone and download it. And then you can either put in a description of a robot and it will give you back the expectations or the perceptions that people will have based on the training data that we used of these uh, 160 some robots. And then if you design new robots, you can throw them in there and you can expand the data set. Um, and it's important that we do this because it's important that we collect the information and the knowledge that people are experiencing. Otherwise it's in little bits and pieces and you always have to design a system and put it in the real world to see what happens. That's not a good way to do science, right? We can't try something and hope for the best. Um, we should plan ahead a little bit. Um, to go in a little bit more about gender, because it's interesting, after all, the next uh, session is about women in robotics. Um, we did an interesting study, uh, Nathan Dendler from my lab did this really interesting study with a, with a robot that is non-gendered, right? This was a robot that we developed with Markim at UPenn. It has a projected face on a spherical um, head, which, by the way, is very hard to do, so I don't recommend it. Um, but anyhow, you can do it. And so we wanted to see whether how people would interact with this robot and we found that just by depending on what we said the robot was like if we said it was a doctor or a nurse that seems like an obvious example and yet if it was a doctor everyone assumed it was male if we said it was a nurse everyone assumed it was female so then we tried different clothes on the robot we tried different voices there were a whole bunch of parameters that you can control but they were very sensitive um, and as I will tell you later, there are some other ways in which you can also control human perceptions. For example, just the voice of the robot. 
But where it gets tricky is that with gender, people kind of tend to be consistent in their perceptions. With voice, people are not consistent at all. And so that's interesting. That tells us something about maybe we can control for gender perception, whereas for voice, we cannot. But what we can do is personalize. So in another study we did, we gave people a few parameters to personalize around robot voice. And that actually had very good fast outcomes. So again, understanding these parameters is, is complex and important. But the physical interaction is important. And so in this, in this room, we are all roboticists. We love robotics. Robots are important. Physical robots are important. But um, outside of this space, um, people don't necessarily believe that. So in human-computer interaction, in HCI, there's a lot of work on simulated agents, agents that are only on the screen. And there's a lot of debate as to why you couldn't just use that for a lot of different uses. And now, of course, more and more so with augmented reality, virtual reality, and dare I say it, metaverse. We'll get back to that. Um, so why bother with physical robots if you're not doing physical work? Um, and it turns out that there are many, many studies. And so we did a meta-analysis, a large-scale metadata analysis of all of the studies that have compared physical robots versus screen-based agents. Um, at least as of 2019, 2018, when we finished it. Um, and there's a very, very strong set of effects that shows that if you have a human interacting with a physical robot versus a, an agent on the screen, the outcomes are very, very strongly in favor of the physical robot. The things you remember, the things you retain, how much you enjoy the interaction, health outcomes, et cetera. So that physicality is really important, even if the robot isn't doing physical work. Why is that? Well, because we're wired to interact with other socially embodied, physically embodied creatures. So, but what about augmented reality and, uh, and mixed reality? This is a big direction now, so we shouldn't ignore it. So how can it help robotics? Um, and so in our lab, we have been for several years now working with mixed reality. And in fact, it turns out this is a whole new growing field. So um, the work on Tom Greshel, who is here, um, it has actually, shown some very interesting both benefits in robotics and benefits on the user with the, the use of mixed reality. So for example, if you're, if you're wearing a headset that's picking up the data about the user, um, you can have a much improved user state estimation, which is clearly a bonus for HRI. Um, at the same time, we can, for example, project enhancements on the robot. So look at that. That's a, that's a Mayfield Curie robot. It doesn't have arms, but to the user, it appears to have arms. And this can be very useful. In particular, for example, if you're using, no, if you're interacting with novice users, you can, for example, use mixed reality to project the robot sensors, to even have a thought bubble that tells the user what the robot is thinking. This is a good way to get users to get acclimated to complex machines that they don't otherwise understand. In fact, we did a study with elderly users who had never interacted with robots um, using mixed reality. So there's a lot of benefit here. Um, I'll also tell you a bit about how it is being used for, um, for teaching and education. But in general, there's this whole new field of um, virtual augmented and mixed reality for HRI. Um, and I think it's a really useful field to watch. So it's interesting to see how we can use this new tool rather than trying to kind of push it aside. Um, let's really think about how AR and VR can, and mixed reality in general can really help us push robotics and HRI in particular forward. But let's get to the core of what this talk is about, which is how do we create robots that are going to make people better? And by better, I mean either physically better, like in terms of medical and health outcomes, or cognitively better, like training and learning, or just better people because we're going to talk about empathy as well. So what does this work generally look like? There's sort of three levels of computational modeling. Um, so we end up trying to model some phenomenon, and you will see, I'll give you many examples, engagement, personality, um, attention, many, many examples. Then we model the user, and then we adapt to the user. Usually not all three of these happen in the same system. We're lucky if we get two at a time and then students graduate. Um, but that's kind of the idea. The idea is that we're trying to understand something complex and then model it computationally by using real-time multimodal data. So just to give you a complex and brave example by my student, Lauren Klein, who is also here. Um, imagine if this is your user. All right, look at that user on the right. This is not an easily persuaded user. This user will do whatever they want, and it's an infant. And what we're interested in is to 
see how we can motivate babies to do exercises. And you can't tell a baby what to do. And if you move their arms around, then their brain is not driving the arms, which means they're not actually learning. And so here is an example of how you can model something and then use it to drive action. So what we did is we looked at the model of surprise. OK, because wh why do we care? Because I can predict where a baby is going to look if I show it a stimulus that is surprising. We all look at surprising stimuli. So there's a model by Long IT and Pierre Baldi that basically tells you in a given visual image where are you most likely to look what will be kind of visually salient and surprising that's where you're going to look now it turns out that model was trained on adults but it works for babies as well this is probably the only example of something that works for adults and babies and that's because it involves early vision so early vision is is there from birth so we can predict where babies are going to look well if i can predict where the baby will look with babies, unlike the rest of you, when it looks somewhere, the baby looks somewhere, the baby tries to move or imitate what it sees. And so if I want the baby to move its right arm, I make it look at the robot's right arm, and then the baby will look there and then imitate. And so this is a way to puppeteer a baby through a computational model. Um, and besides it being really fun, of course it doesn't always work and they get tired and they cry, but it's fundamentally the only way you can get the baby to move in a particular way. You can't tell them, you can't make other baby, babies tell them. And if you as an adult move around and try to get them to imitate, they usually just imitate the face. We're too big. It's not triggering mirror neurons. So it needs to be a robot, and it needs to be a robot the size of a baby. So it's really, I just think it's a beautiful piece of work that takes a computational model of surprise and uses it to drive the perception and therefore the action of both the robot and the baby. That's some pretty cool work. So that's why I love my amazing students like Lauren. Um, here's another example of modeling. We were interested in modeling bullying. We wanted to make a robot detect bullying. So we trained, we wanted to train the robot on a lot of bullying data. How do you get bullying data? Well, I mean, bullies don't want to be recorded. So this now goes uh, a little while, while back, but it is interesting to think about how can you collect the data? And in this case, we were able to do a really simple model of bullying in the lab. And then we basically had the, had the robot with a very simple model interact with a lot of kids. And when you give kids a sensitive robot, they bully it immediately. And that allowed us to generate much more data, which could then train the model. Um, so again, this is an important point because we usually assume that they're training data available. A lot of these perceptual models today that are using machine learning are depending on a lot of data, but you can't always have the data, especially in HRI. The, the contexts where, that are sensitive don't provide the data. Now, I want to tell you about modeling deception, lying. Okay, why do we care? I mean, after all, why should I care about lying and what does it have to do with robotics? It has a lot to do with robotics because, first of all, people love to trick robots, right? This is already happening in the real world. So people will, once we put robots in the world, they will lie to robots and we will cheat and we'll do all kinds of things. So the robots being able to detect when someone is either being funny or lying would be useful. More fundamentally, we were interested in understanding deception because we we're interested in working with people who are suffering from depression or anxiety, and they're maybe masking it and not wanting to um, admit to it, and we would like to understand if they really are having trouble so that we can help them. So uh, my extremely talented student, Lena Mather, actually found a data set of people giving testimony in court and some were lying and some were telling the truth and it was an annotated data set and so that we can do supervised learning on it. And here's a surprise. Um, how good do you think people are at detecting lying? We're terrible. We're basically a chance. And every, if, even if you are very highly skilled at detecting micro, exception, micro expressions in faces, then you can get it about 65%. But generally, as humans, we're wired to be trusting. I know that's really hard to believe in 2022. Um, but we're really bad at detecting lying. So it was extremely interesting and somewhat sobering to find out that we can train a machine learning model that was extremely good at detecting lying. I mean, it was out there, you know, in the 80%. So that was bizarre, way better than people. But then again, it had training data. So that's a luxury. What if you don't have training data? Well, that's another thing that Lena tried. She actually used a, a training set from just actors and trained it, and it was still highly effective, about 74% accuracy at detecting lying. Again, way better than humans. Um, so this is interesting, because usually when you train machine learning models on, on data that are not really the same as what you're testing them on, it doesn't always transfer. 
right? And in our work, generally it doesn't, but with lying, it does. So this tells me one thing. Detecting lying is actually very easy for machines. It may be poor for people, but for machines, it's very easy. On the other hand, some things that are very easy for us are very hard for machines. For example, detecting if the user is actually interested and engaged in the interaction. So this is so basic, right? If you're doing HRI, human robot interaction, you want the user to be engaged. The user has to be engaged. Otherwise, you know, they're not paying attention. But being able to automatically detect whether someone is actually engaged in the interaction is not at all trivial. Now, you may think, well, just look at eye gaze, head direction. Well, I mean, they might be looking to the side to get someone else to get involved. So that's that looks like they're not interested, but actually they are. Or if they have atypical eye gaze patterns, such as, for example, individuals on the spectrum, autism spectrum, they might be looking out of the corner of their eye. And if you don't have an individualized model, you won't know that this person is really engaged for their notion of engagement. So engagement, such a basic thing, really hard. Deception, such a basic thing, really easy. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because we fundamentally don't have a good sense of what is hard and what is easy to model computationally. We're just starting to discover it because we're just starting to study these problems. So our intuitions can be very wrong. You might think, oh, lying, that, that's going to be hard. It's not. Oh, engagement, that'll be easy. It's not. So it's interesting to start doing this thing. And so we have done quite a lot of work, actually, uh, with data with children with autism because we're very interested in creating machines that children will be interested in working with. So for example, during the pandemic, when kids were forced to stay at home, wouldn't it have been great for all the kids to have these kinds of robots to help them through? Um, but no, sadly, we didn't have that. Now, in our analysis of data from a study that we did in the homes of kids with autism, we left the robot in for a month, um, and I'll show you a video in a minute. It was really interesting to look at the data, and we had daily interactions over a month. So that's, that's a fair amount of data. Um, and basically what we find is one, that multimodal data are necessary, so we need the video and the audio and body pose in order to make sense out of what the user is doing, which doesn't tend to happen. Most people are still doing just video data maybe on the face. Um, so we really need to bring these modalities together. We also find, oops, sorry, we also find, as you will see later, I will talk more about it, that it is very, very difficult to generalize from one user to another. So one, you can't have models with a lot of data. And two, even when you do across users, it doesn't really help you. More users isn't better. Um, so this is a hard thing for machine learning to absorb because in machine learning, usually the more data, the better. Well, it depends. It depends on, on the kind of data. And when it comes to autism data, more, beta, more data is not better. All right, so let's talk about another phenomenon, empathy. So empathy is something that, that we're very interested in because in generally empathy is um, feeling what someone else is feeling or wanting to help someone else. This is a good thing. Not only is it a good thing to do in society, but it actually makes the person who is empathetic uh, feel better and have better health. So even if you're a mercenary, it's good to be good. So we wanted to understand not how robots can appear empathetic. That has been done in HRI. Uh, so people have already created robots that seem like they care about what you're saying and they care for you. Okay, we are interested in people being empathetic. So we wanted to create robots that can make the, the user be empathetic. Like, what should I as a robot say and do so that you will be nice to me? That would be useful, remember, because people are the ones that are kicking and hitting the robots. So how can we do this? Uh, so first we did a study, a user study, where we just looked at different things that a, that a robot storyteller could, could tell a robot, uh, can tell a user to see what people found to be, uh, to cause empathy. And we found that, first of all, the, if this robot is talking about people, then people showed the most empathy. So that's nice. People still like people best. You can relax. Nobody's preferring robots to people. Uh, so if a robot talks about people versus talking about robots, the robot that's talking about people is the one that people like the best. If a robot is talking about itself versus another robot, people like the robot that's talking about itself best. Well, unless it's arrogant, but basically first person narratives are most appealing. And we actually looked at people's microfacial expressions and we could correlate that with when they said they were feeling empathetic and they correlated, which means they really were feeling empathy. Now, 
the next thing we did is we did, built a model now, of course, as we love to do now, because that's what everyone does, right? We took a bunch of data and we did a model to see if we can predict automatically when a robot would elicit empathy. And we did pretty well. Uh, it's the first computational model of, of eliciting empathy. It's around 69% accurate, not bad. So basically it means we can now have a robot that will kind of guess pretty accurately if something it does is going to make you feel empathetic. So we did then another study to see, okay, what are the other kinds of things that make people feel empathetic? So um, we worked again with the Curry robot. We really like that one, even though the company has gone out of business, but the robot is really good. Um, so we wanted to see what can that robot do to get help? So in HRI, we talk a lot about human robot collaboration. Sometimes the human needs help, sometimes the robot needs help. How can the robot get help? Okay, so we wanted to look at three different narratives. The robot is neutral. It just kind of says, I've detected a, an error. Can you please help me? Or it's funny. Oh, I'm usually pretty good, but this time I'm failing. Or it's sad. Oh, I'm afraid I'm really failing, et cetera. And we found that with very high um, you know, statistical significance, people love sad robots. So this was surprising. I actually thought that people would find sad robots annoying. Uh, personally, I would, but apparently I'm an outlier. And so when robots are sad, people are very happy to help. And when robots are funny, people do not like it. So this is interesting. You know, I, I think I'd actually like a funny robot. Wow, I'm really, my, my hypotheses are all wrong. Um, because people actually like robots that are pathetic and sad and they want to help. When the robot is funny, that doesn't engender any kind of empathy. And when robots are neutral, people are kind of like, eh, whatever, you know, sort of also neutral. So I guess, you know, we should have robots that are sad. This, well, of course, you know, it happens what over time is difficult to see how people would continue to like it, but certainly to engender in, in short term interactions, right? Like if you're in a store and that's where abuse of robots been, has been observed. For example, uh, Pepper at SoftBank stores has been abused quite a bit. Um, in these kind of short term interactions, then it tells you something about how the robot should behave in order to make people nicer. Um, all right, we are um, another kind of example of, of uh, empathy and vulnerability. I told you that we're very interested in working with people uh, who have depression or, or mental health challenges, because this is a, an epidemic scale challenge in the Western world. Um, so we were interested in seeing what can a robot say to the person to get them to relax and be able to talk about what they're feeling, because we're interested in support groups. Right? So during the pandemic, there was a lot of isolation, a lot of people needed support, but they couldn't get it. And so we were interested in creating um, agents and really physical robots that would be uh, that would mediate support groups. Um, and so we've done this actually, we've collected data on this, we found that people are actually very willing to lower gu their guard and talk about their um, stressors around robots. Um, and interestingly, People really like robots that say things like, I know how you feel, and sometimes I have problems. And again, that's really interesting because we all know that robots do not feel anything. So even the people who are interacting with the robots in these studies, they know that the robot isn't feeling anything, but they're very willing to suspend disbelief and they prefer the robot that's talking to them as if it was feeling something. So this is interesting, again, it's counterintuitive, but this is what people prefer. So this is important as we're building therapeutic machines. That the affective interaction, the emotional interaction is actually not only accepted by people, but preferred to just kind of blah baseline. All right, but what really works then in these multi-party interactions is really the robot understanding not just what the person is saying, or but also understanding where they're looking and so on. So my, my student, uh, Chris Birmingham, who's also here. Okay, there are only three of them, so don't worry. It doesn't seem like I brought 50 people. Um, I wish. Um, but anyway, Chris did this really interesting thing when he was developing human-robot interaction for multi-party. So a group of humans and the robot. And the robot is trying to understand who is talking, who should be talking, taking turns. This is a hard problem. This is an open problem in HCI. Um, and so Chris was able to win a competition by doing something that seems obvious and yet hadn't really been done, which is instead of just looking and listening to who is talking, he would also look at where people were looking. And by using those multiple modalities at the same time, the system was much, much better at predicting and then taking turns and then becoming much more natural, which then of course would lead people to accept the robot more. Um, 
again, it seems like everyone should be using multimodal data, but people still aren't, um, which is then why we end up with these machines that are not really well accepted. Um, some other domains that we worked in um, for multi-party interactions, we're very interested in classrooms. Classrooms are like the ultimate hard, maybe second only to IROS at lunch break. But uh, classrooms are this very complex interaction, lots of people, lots of kids acting in all kinds of ways, especially between classes. And so we were interested in how we can have kids who have to be at home because of either physical or, or social or emotional disability, um, but could have a remote presence in the classroom. This is before the pandemic. And uh, we were interested in seeing how we can enable that. And so we collected a, a ton of data. We're still analyzing it. One of the points I want to make about this work is that it can literally take years to collect the data and then analyze the data and then get the papers out. And most people don't want to take that time but you know, when the students do, uh, they end up having better skills and more impactful research. So I'm, I'm very proud of them. Okay, so I wanna go back now um, to some of the things that I talked about at the beginning, just to kind of tie things together, right? So we're talking about machines that are able to understand the human in real time, model some kind of a phenomenon, whether it's engagement, whatever it may be, and then adapt to the user. So if the users are learning, how can we get the robot to adapt over time to each learner? So this personalization is what's really important. So using augmented reality is a very powerful tool to actually improve learning outcomes. And here is how, and this is work of Tom Greshel again. Um, he gave a talk yesterday, um, but I was stuck on a late flight. So um, it turns out that when, in order for us to learn and retain information, if we're just sitting and not moving, like we all are now, well, I'm standing, but the rest of you are sitting, it turns out you're not learning nearly as much as if you were standing and moving around. So we understand this with children, right? We understand that children need to stand up and jump around and touch things in order to learn, but then we forget it and throw it out. And this is unfortunate because our brains are still the same brains. Um, so if you let learners move around, they learn more they retain better and they enjoy the experience. And so in Tom's work, um, Tom has kind of developed this measure of kinesthetic curiosity. The idea being that by using um, AR glasses, students can see code blocks because he's teaching them to code, code blocks in 3D and they can reach for a code block and move it around just the way that they do on the screen, except this is 3D, they're moving their body. Now here's a really interesting effect just by having those code blocks in 3D and physically moving, what that ends up doing for kids, and they have a little robot tutor, uh, the same one you saw before, the, the Curry robot. This causes kids to be more curious in learning. And being curious in learning, not being afraid of failure, makes kids learn better and retain information longer. So if you're coding and you're afraid to try things because you think you'll fail, then of course you're not going to learn as much. It's exploration versus exploitation, right? You have to explore. You have to find, you know, all kinds of policies. But kids don't. They're afraid of failure. But when they're moving around physically and moving that knowledge or information physically, they're more willing to explore. So this is a really, again, a really interesting example of how physical embodiment causes the person to do something like learning in a better way. And having the robot there in physical space can also be beneficial. It ends up bringing kids together so they now work collaboratively. Um, so Tom has done a bunch of studies in classrooms, very brave work. But in the end, it just takes a tablet. We can do cheap, lightweight AR with just, just a tablet. And they hold a tablet and the robot is on the ground and suddenly there's a shared world between the user and the robot through this tablet. And in this world, the robot is much better at perception and behavior and may have extra arms and thought bubbles and you name it. Um, and there's a very powerful learning effect. All right, some other stuff we're doing in the long term, we're looking at um, human, again, remember babies, can't give up on babies. Um, so we're looking at modeling stress and, and helping caregivers interact. Ideally, you'll have this robot that's just sitting there and helping, observing an interaction and helping people uh, and caregivers to interact better because stress, something that everyone is experiencing, um, parental or caregiver stress actually causes the infant to have atypical eye gaze patterns um, and atypical development. So it's, infant development is very, very sensitive and it's, it, it re kids respond to the environment around them. And so if the, the parents are unfortunately stressed, that ends up being bad for the kid and the parent. So 
to some of the things. This brings us back to the machine learning challenges. Um, everyone is always talking about training a model for a specific thing, right? And, and I told you the same thing, model of deception, uh, model of engagement, but there's no single model that works really for a particular task. So right now in the history of machine learning, we're mostly doing single model training, right? Mostly. But it turns out that's just not going to work because it really depends, even within a single interaction, the dynamics change and different models may be most predictive at different times during the interaction. So even with infants, this is true. And they're just kicking. So it's not like, a, it's not a super rich interaction. They're looking and kicking. And yet different models work better at different phases of the interaction. So what that's saying is that as we look ahead at these machine learning approaches to understanding behavior and predicting behavior, we really have to look at hybrid methods, different kinds of models and bringing different kinds of models together over time in a time series likely. And then there's this issue of missing data. So for example, in autism, uh, there's never enough data. So how do, you, how do we deal with that? So we were looking at some diversity algorithms that could create synthetic data. And it can work really well. And you've seen some of these ideas also with like, you know, creating, like you can look at um, systems that will take art and create other art that is like the first art. Like, like I can take your picture and I can create many versions of your face. Um, now it doesn't look like you anymore, but it is diversity. So it depends what you're trying to do. Do you want many faces? Great. Do you want many versions of you specifically? Not so great. Um, so to, to the point of modeling, basically the, the particular historical moment we're in is we think that our models are very powerful, but they're very narrow. So we're going to have to look at hybrid models and interesting ways of dealing with missing data for whatever model we're using. Um, and we experienced a lot of trouble with missing data in our work with autism where we worked very hard with a team at, at Yale and MIT to put together a robots that we can leave in the home for a month at a time, which is incidentally no companies have done, right? But a bunch of graduate students did. Um, and this is what it looks like just for a moment. Meet Adrian. Ad Oops, I would like this to be louder. We, you are doing an amazing job. On this weekend morning, they've settled in to play some games. Along with big brother Darren, Adrian is on the autism spectrum, and Kiwi is no toy. It's a socially assistive robot. You are doing really great. Keep up the good work. So I've shown this before. We are still analyzing the data and still publishing papers uh, that are building models based on the data that we collected in this study. So that's why I keep bringing it up, because it's, it's not over, even though the study and the data collection are over. Um, and yet, you still can't buy a robot that will do very easily something for a child with autism in a helpful way, which is unfortunate. Um, and in particular during the pandemic, it would have been very helpful. Um, so there's some really interesting questions about how do you motivate kids that go, that go well beyond um, intelligent tutoring systems and are really well done on a physical robot, much more so than on a screen-based agent. Um, and then there's some really difficult questions about how do you deal with data that are inconsistent and have great variance, which is definitely true for autism, but it might be true for, for other domains as well. So a village of people led by Zhang Aoshi in my lab did the first computational model of looking at affect, balance and arousal, which are these dimensions of affect, um, with data from a long period of time with kids with autism. And you know, one of the lessons was that you, it's very hard to generalize across multiple kids. And so we ended up looking at transfer learning and the minimum amount of data from each individual that you need that you can actually have a predictive model. It's a very hard problem. Now, you might think, wow, she's spending a lot of time talking about these computational models. Why isn't she talking about robots? Well, the reality is the computational and machine learning methods now are a massive bootstrap for perception and action on physical robots. And so if we want robots around people, we have to understand human behavior. Because otherwise, people just won't put up, at least not for more than five minutes at a time. The novelty wears off. Um, and so we're still in that world of HRI and SAR, socially assistive robotics, needing more data sets, more multimodal, long-term personalization methods. People are still not working on this. It's still not out there. So we need more people working on this. Come on, get in there, collect some data, work on some tough stuff. Um, because every user is different, every user changes over time. Um, so we really have to personalize and we have really have to think about, so how do we do that? Um, and so 
I just want to tell you about where we're moving in now in our own work. Um, turns out 30 years in robotics and you still can't go into a robot store and just buy, choose some robots and buy them. And so this is, I believe, the third round of, fourth round of building robots in the lab and making them available to the field that we're doing. So uh, we're inspired by the very low cost um, 3D printed platform of Blossom, uh, which also can be soft. And so we're going to, we're, we just got a grant to make this kind of a, a community resource. But we specifically in our work are interested in um, putting them in dorms to work with adolescents and college students um, who are suffering from anxiety and depression, which in, in the United States at least is pervasive. It's like more than 70% of all college students are, are suffering now. Um, so we're interested in having the robot be kind of a coach and a friend with mindfulness exercises, breathe, breathing exercises, self-regulation. We're also looking at algorithms to understand, um, to detect sort of biomarkers, behavioral markers of depression and anxiety. Um, also some correlated things like ASD and ADHD. Um, so, and then multi-party as we, so as we talked about before, we have a grant in which we're putting a robot with a group of people, a support group, to see if we can get them to share among themselves and kind of help one another. Um, and then also working with dementia and using, again, people have been talking about using robots with the elderly forever, but now with, with the increased numbers of, of the instance of dementia, especially during the pandemic, we saw that with the elderly, um, there's some really interesting things that can be done. Two major enablers that I'm going to mention and then I'm wrapping up. One is large language models. I mean, unless unless you have been dozing in the last couple of years, you hear everywhere about large language models. So this is exciting, right? Because now you can just talk to a computer and it'll say things that sound meaningful and sometimes really are. Um, and so finally, right, we can have robots that talk to people without us building uh, behavior trees, or rather build, well, we have to build behavior trees, but maybe we don't have to build dialogue trees. Um, so this is a real enabler. So we're looking for these robots that are going to interact with kids. You can have educational content, you can have self-regulation content, uh, therapeutic content, all kinds of interesting stuff. And then we're also interested in haptics, right? So something about haptics, haptics is hard. I'm not a haptics expert, but something about having a soft robot that provides another channel of um, communication, tactile communication between the user and the robot. So these are new directions, right? Because it's not enough what we're doing. Always got to do more. Um, but there's just a lot of promise. And so I end as always by saying that these kinds of systems have been shown to have tremendous potential, right? There, there are more than 15,000 peer reviewed studies on robots for autism just robots for autism, peer reviewed journal papers, good stuff, not like your random thing. Um, it, the outcomes are there. There are no companies really, but the outcomes are there. So there's a lot of promise. And so I am excited when young people get into the field and work on this because there's so much to do. We need to work on real world problems, but there's no shortage of them. Um, we need some data. So come on, help and collect data. But now there are these wonderful opportunities of connecting to other work like, you know, big language models and so on. It's, it's a really exciting time, great time to get in. Um, and with that, I want to thank um, all of my wonderful students who have worked on this work over the years. That's the photo from 2019. I need to update it, but it's got everyone in it. And then also, I just want to thank the organizers because, um, like I said, my last, my first IROS was in, in 92. So, wow, I'm old. Um, maybe it was 91. Anyway, we can't remember because we're old. So um, I want to thank the organizers for getting us to this beautiful place um, to meet with real people in the physical world. We forgot what that was like. Um, it's pretty awesome. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Hey, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, empathetic uh, detection that you use uh, in users. Did you use um, a certain scale to detect exactly in which kind of story the user was more empathetic and which kind of story he liked the most, um, depending on, let's say, the, the content of the story or the, uh, the people involved or 
Yes, so that's a great question. What are, you know, what are the measures that we're using? Um, and first of all, I will always say that um, a lot of behavioral studies are done with questionnaires, but questionnaires are generally flawed because self-report is flawed. And so we like uh, functional measures. We, we do questionnaires because mm -hmm. we want to know what people think, mm -hmm. but that's also flawed. So for example, that's why um, we asked them, we did a, you know, a bunch of questionnaires where we asked them, you know, how, which, like, you know, which, which one of these did you most relate to? Why did you like them, et cetera? But then we also looked at their facial expressions while they were interacting to cross correlate. Um, usually we prefer to use existing measures, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, if I'm dealing with someone who has anxiety, I wanna use an anxiety questionnaire. I don't want to invent my own. So whenever we can, we use existing questionnaires like in HRI, there are a bunch of questionnaire tools. In this case, though, for empathy, we did to have to develop our own. Um, so we, you know, we would just basically ask them. And and of course, as a study, I encourage you to look at the paper. You know, mm -hmm. everything was randomized, etc. So hopefully, good design. Thank you. Uh, I have another question, if it's mm -hmm. possible. Yeah, about your soft robots uh, in dorms and uh, about interaction with people dealing with anxiety, for example. Um, do you measure, measure, want to measure, let's say, the nonverbal interactions of those people uh, and their engagement in the different exercises that you propose to them in order to improve them? Yeah, so we are just getting this work off the ground, you know, submitting uh, human subjects approvals. So I don't have any results to report. Um, but we, we want, so as many, I always say with studies, you want to collect all the data you possibly can within privacy concerns, right? So we want to see, for example, how often they will choose to interact. I think the choice is important. Um, for example, when we did the study with autism, right, we asked people to interact with a robot once a day, five days a week. And even whether they did or didn't was a measure of how engaged they were, right? So I liked free choice as a part of the experiment design, right? So first of all, how much did they interact? How long did they interact in each session, right? Suppose if you use a language model, it could be quite generative and the interaction could go on for a long time. Does it get longer? Does it get shorter? Our past work showed that actually, at least with children, the more opportunities they had to interact with the robot, the longer they interacted. So it was the opposite of the novelty effect. It wasn't like, oh, it's fun now, but I'm bored tomorrow. It was more that they relaxed and got more and more interested. So those are the kinds of things we'll measure. Um, in terms of privacy, observing their facial affect, we might do a study in which we're only collecting audio. Audio is still identifiable, but most people are less worried about those data being shared than video. But if we can, we would love video and audio, then we can do um, obviously a lot more. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll take yeah. three more questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. I have a question. I'm not so sure that maybe his first question was a bit related, but uh, you mentioned right about uh, improving the human's well-being, not necessarily about uh, helping health or not helping necessarily some collaboration works or something. But then, how would you define really metric? Something ultimate metric, where you see some kind of possible ways of measure the improving the human's well-being, civility, well-being, yeah, well, uh, well-being. So okay, so. We to me, the whole notion of socially assistive robotics, and thank you for the question, because it allows me to now say this and then Oat can't cut me off yet. Um, <laughs> but really, the whole point of socially assistive robotics compared to social robotics is that it has these three words in it, socially and assistive and robotics. There's got to be a physical robot. It has to be assistive and it has to use social things, social means. The assistive part is critical. It means that you can measure something and there's an outcome. So. This gets back to the other question, which is what are the outcome measures? Okay, there have to be some real measures. But for example, when we worked with kids with autism, we had a pre-post evaluation and we looked at did their cognitive skills improve on the games? Did their social skills improve in terms of turn taking, not interrupting, initiating dialogue and so on? So they're hard measures. And I think that's what I was also getting at. You can do questionnaires but we tend to want to do some kind of hard measures, right? So with empathy, again, we looked at, did they say they empathized with this robot versus this robot? And also did their fa unconscious facial expressions express empathy as expected? So we always want to have a hard measure. And I think that's really critical because if you don't have a hard measure, well, I mean, yeah, people like it, whatever. Even when you have, have a hard measure, as with any study, it's just that study. So it's hard to say anything about other environments, other users, but at least it's telling you something concrete. 
Um, is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for the very inspiring talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because robots are now helping children. You always say that they're helping children with autism. And what if they, well, this is maybe a philosophical question. What if they start to grow up with those robots and they get emotionally invested in them, like their, their parent, a friend or something. And then after that therapy session or something is finished and it, the robot is taken away from them, both those children have some sort of trauma developed. That's a really good question. It comes up a lot. Um, and I didn't talk a lot about, you know, the, the philosophy of what we do. I, I just assume everybody knows. I, but that's I'm really glad you're giving me an opportunity to say it. The point of the robot, the point of any technology is that it should be a catalyst to help people exist in this world. This is why I'm not a fan of virtual reality, because it's not helping us be in this world. Um, same with um, socially assisted robotics. It's supposed to help the child interact with other children. So, for example, you know, in some of our earlier work, we were hoping that we could put a robot in the school. And if a child with autism who doesn't have friends because nobody wants to play with them because they're different, um, if they have a robot, the robot might make other kids interested in playing with them. So it's really a catalyst, an attractor to bring other kids in. It gives them opportunities to practice. But nonetheless, you make a really good point. And this is a point that doesn't have to do with robots. This is a point about therapy. You can learn a lot of things in a therapeutic medical context, but will they generalize to the real world? That's always the problem. That's why the best kinds of behavioral therapies require practice in the real world. Like whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy, whatever it may be, you have to practice in the real world. And so the idea of the robot is really to be a support mechanism for being in this world with other people, with you know difficult homework, with depressing news, Right, so that's, that has to be the case. Cause you're right, if it's just the robot and it's all fun with the robot and then you leave the robot and the world is no better and you're no better, that, that's a problem. But if we're gonna be philosophical, there is another philosophical way to think about it, which is that some communities and the autism community is one of them um, actually will say, well, you know, why do, why do you even have to change the person? Right? Why isn't the person okay in their difference and in being different? And that is a fundamentally philosophical problem. So we don't touch that one. <laughs> we stay away from that one, but that's a really good question. Thank you very much. Ken. Oh, good, thank you. Thank you so much, Maya, for, for all these really interesting results and for your, for your, your all of this work. Um, the last thing you said about large language models made me think about the concern that Sometimes people will develop a trust around these machines, and then it will do something that reveals itself to be a machine. And that might be very jarring. So I'm wondering if you could say a word, few words about the, the, the uncanny valley effect and how you think about that in your work. Ah, thank you. Of course, Ken would ask me an excellent question. And thank you. This is such a, there's so many opportunities to, to uh, talk even longer. No. So um, <clears throat> uncanny valley, uh, Great point. So we, we and others, of course, have observed uncanny valley effects around robot appearance, right? So if the robot is very realistic, but its behavior or capabilities don't match, you get cognitive dissonance and people find that creepy. We've also observed it around voice. So if the, you know, if the voice is too good or sounds like a human, people don't like that. Um, but I think you're exactly right with large language models. Um, if the premise is that the robot or the human or whatever, the, the computer is as smart as a human, that's a problem. So we have actually been looking at this for, for example, therapeutic interactions. And I was shocked at how good uh, certain language models were without training. Mm -hmm. So that's not even with few shot training uh, examples. So they are really amazing, but of course you can't be sure that it won't say the wrong thing. And it won't, and when it does, it will not be a, an obvious thing. It won't be like, oh, I'm feeling suicidal. Oh, that's fine, right? It's not gonna be anything that dumb. But it is possible that there could be a bad outcome. So what people are doing is they're doing also meta level yeah. learning so that they could avoid those bad outcomes, right? So I, I think there are ways to get around it. But I think your point is deeper, which is how can we ultimately know? It's like deep fakes. You may not ever know and it will be abused. And I, I hear you completely. I mean, we're at this really exciting time now where every time I listen to the news or a podcast, there's a new thing AI has now made possible. You know, should we have a art made by AI? I don't know. I know lots of starving artists, but there it is. 
Um, and so I guess I'm thinking just like with every other thing, well, let's try and use it for good because it'll be used for all kinds of things. But these big language models are really enabling and we have to think about how we can use them because they will get used. I mean, think about it like Wobot is an app that, that is there to help people who are depressed and it's a chat bot and it didn't have a big language model, probably will soon, right? So it's already out there. So how can we do it well? But I think we're all riding this crazy wave and we'll see where it takes us. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you very much for all these wonderful thoughts. Uh, with this, we'll close the session and thank again Maya. <laughs>